Hi everyone, Joe Conkley in the shop. We're gonna do a little uh, follow-up on the uh, Gibson J45 that we were looking at recently. Uh, let's uh, take a look at where we are here. The neck reset is, uh, has been done. The neck is on and uh, it went well. Uh, we've got a nice angle, a nice fit to the heel of the neck to the sides here. And of course the fingerboard extension is glued down. There were a couple of questions that came up about the fingerboard extension itself. So uh, it is true that when you're angling the neck back in this way to improve the uh, action and saddle height and the relationship of the neck to the bridge. Um, in that, this point right here at the 14th fret where the, f 14th fret where the fingerboard, the neck, and the body all meet at this fulcrum point right here. That when you do this, there should be a corresponding change to this fingerboard extension where as you, you know, it's going to come up like this. So what do you do about that? Now you have a gap here between the top and the end of the fingerboard here. One option, of course, is just to glue the fingerboard down. Um, and it's fairly flexible. That can happen. And usually what we're talking about here is um, at most uh, 45, 50 thousandths, you know, gap right here between the top and the end of the fingerboard. And more common is like about a 30 thousandths, 30, a 32nd of an inch gap there. So, but it does make a pretty big difference in the look of what the neck looks like when you sight down from the end and sort of the performance of these frets, if you will, in the setup of the thing. So, um, one standard option is to put a tapered shim where the thickest point would be here at the end of the fingerboard and taper to zero somewhere here between the 14th and 15th fret. Um, and that basically allows this look when you sight down the neck, say from this point where you're looking at this sort of train track effect from the top or when you're sighting down one edge or the other, where in general, to the naked eye, you see a pretty nice straight fingerboard from here to there. You know, from the nut all the way to the end of the uh, neck. Um, the subtle differences there is that um, it's definitely a good thing to have from this 14th fret to this 19th or 20th fret, whatever it is, for this part of the fingerboard to actually drop off just a little bit, but not, not a ton so that you see a big bend there. It can result in other problems. So um, th th there's all that information. But what's interesting about this particular one is I didn't have to put that uh, shim, tapered shim on this one because um, so in the initial uh, configuration of the neck before I took it off, what was happening was I had, I had the opposite where the neck was sitting like this and um, this part of the fingerboard was sitting like that. So the, the fingerboard was actually tipped up. So when I removed the neck, changed the neck angle here, used this as a fulcrum point, bent the neck back like that, um, this fingerboard actually, you know, its projection was perfect without a shim. Um, it drops off just a little bit, you know, like say five thousandths of an inch or less. Let me take another look at this myself. Yeah. And that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a nice sort of smooth curve from end to end here with very little drop off. So that was a big plus. I, I didn't have to put the shim in. Um, when you put the shim in, you, you can see it from the edge here where there, 
you know, it makes this point thicker and this point thin, which looks a little odd. You're playing that off against not having an odd look in this way. So in any case, the bottom line was I didn't have to put a shim on this one, which is nice in one manner of speaking because, uh, well, it just moved me ahead in gluing the neck on because uh, usually uh, that will delay by a full day getting the neck glued on. If I'm ready to glue the neck on, and now that I'm ready to glue the neck on and that, I've got the fit, the angle, I've also made the two shims or whatever shimming I need to do to the interior dovetail hill to make it nice and tight. Then I take a look at that fingerboard extension and decide what to do. I would say 70, 80% of the time, at least 80, probably 80, 90% of the time, I'm putting the shim on there. And when I see that, then I have to make that shim, glue it on, let that dry overnight, put the neck on the next day rather than that day. So I didn't have to do that in this case. So now I am, uh, I've, uh, I've done the frets too. Um, if, you, if you remember, to, one of the first steps to take the neck off is to loosen this fingerboard extension with heat to separate that glue line. And at the same time, I, I, I'm heating up these frets so it makes it much easier to remove the 15th fret, drill those two holes down in there. That's uh, where the steam goes in and comes out uh, or uh, whatever heat you're using to loosen the, the dovetail joint. Um, and so uh, I put the 15th fret back in level the frets. And that's where I'm at. I'm about to start uh, polishing up those frets to uh, finish that off. And then it's a matter of making the saddle. I've also fit the bridge pins. Fit my bridge pins. I have several of these handy dandy little bridge pin holders. The low E, capital, the high E. Small, same thing here, so that I, each pin has a specific hole to go into. And one of the things that I, I've also done this, I take a very close look at where that string would leave here, coming up to the nut and where it falls on the neck. That's another thing I'm looking at when I do the neck set, is to make sure the neck goes on correctly in this way. And uh, I can use the bridge pin for a very subtle changes in that. So uh, when I re-glue the bridge, for sure, at the very least, there's glue that gets up into this hole. Um, and uh, so that needs to be cleaned out. I take the proper uh, reamer. You can see the three there that's almost wearing out. This is my three degree pin reamer. This is my five degree. Um, and I match that up with the pin itself. A lot of times from the manufacturer the, the, will tell us what uh, taper that is, but there are various different ways that I can figure that out. And in addition to just cleaning that hole out so I can fit this pin down so it fits right up against that little collar, fairly flush. That's what I'm looking for. Because these reamers have this solid side on them and then the other side, which, you know, these one, two, those two flutes plus these two edges, so like four, several different cutting edges. I can just sit it in there and spin it around so it just brings the, brings the pin to seat down deeper into that hole. Or if I need to move that hole subtly because of this left to right, um, I can. So uh, one of the things I wanted to do on this was that the the string was falling pretty close to this treble side of the fingerboard. I wanted to subtly move it this way a little bit. So when I put this reamer in here, I put the solid side of the reamer on the outside and, and just spun it in the hole like that. So the, the cutting that I was doing was on this side of the hole. So I'm actually moving the pin this way just a little bit. To, just a, a uh, I'm thinking about this stuff the whole way through, trying to make sure that everything is, is uh, lining up and, and uh, looking for the end result that I want. 
and if there is something that I can do to influence things just uh, toward the, the, the right way that I want, I do it. At that uh, pin, at the uh, bridge pin uh, fitting stage. Uh, I think that's, that's all I got here for this one. Um, I'm going to finish up polishing up the frets and make myself a saddle. And this thing's going to be uh, done. I dare say, sometimes I don't like to say that word out loud because, because of the obvious. So anyhow, that's what I got for you here, the, uh, the 1969 J45, almost done. Thanks for tuning in to this follow-up, and uh, we'll see you again soon.